If your Bibles, please turn to 1 John chapter 5. It's hard to believe we are at the last part of, of our study here of 1 John. I was going through my notes, and we've done about 15 sermons, and this is about the fourth month that we've been on it. But I hope and pray that it has really challenged you about what it means to have an authentic faith in Christ Jesus. And that's what I want to talk about today, because we live in a world where we are struggling between what's fake and what's authentic, right? In fact, there's so much confusion today between what is fake and counterfeit, between what is genuine and authentic. I have a few examples up there. We all know these fake news, right? We've all heard that term fake news, and I'm not going to pick any media outlet here because I think all of them are guilty at some level. But because of fake news, listen, Gallup poll said that there's such a mistrust in the media today because of fake news that only 34% of people today have great deal or fair amount of confidence in the media. I'm sure if I'd walk around and ask you guys, you probably, most of you would say, I don't really trust the media today. I'm not sure what they're really trying to tell me. How about, uh, and what it's left us with this idea of fake news, what can we believe and what should we not believe, right? We all ask that question when we see a, the media put something out. How about fake products? I read an article this morning by Wirecutter. The article is called, Welcome to the Era of Fake Products. And this is what they said. The rise of counterfeit goods and other phony products sold on the internet has been swift. It has largely gone unnoticed by many shoppers. Over several months of research, we were able to purchase items through Amazon Prime that were either confirmed counterfeits, lookalikes, unsafe for use, or otherwise misrepresented. Now, if you're like my wife, who Amazon Prime's her best friend, this is a shocking article. But it's the reality, right? And so what has happened is we go out there as the consumer, we're asking ourselves, what should we buy and what products can we really trust? Or how about this? Many of you may have never heard of this. It's called fake technology. Really, the term's called deep fake technology. So just to give you a little summary of what this is all about, they can create images of fake people and post them online that look like real people. And beyond that, they can also take the image of a real person and put them into a video that's a fake video. And so when we see online, we're often left, what is fake? What is artificial? We struggle with this. So to kind of help us out as consumers out there, they've put together some tests. Ways for you to know what's the difference between true and fake news and true and fake products and true and fake um, technology. But you know the sad thing is, just like we see the, all these examples of what can be fake versus what is authentic, we face the same reality in the church. You see, the church today is not exempt from people who have walked through the doors who today, right now, have a fake faith in Jesus Christ. And that reality is why John has written this book. Because John wants us all to step back and take an evaluation of our own walk with Christ to say, hey, look it, is your faith in Christ, is it fake, is it counterfeit, or is it authentic and genuine? Now, as we've gone through our last so many weeks on this study, what has John done for us? He has given us tests to know whether or not we have true, genuine faith. And I love what John has done. John has not just presented this as, well, maybe he's presented as, well, I want you to be certain about this. Because even though these tests up here try to test whether it's fake news or fake products, at the end of the day, we sometimes don't always know, do we? But that's the difference with John. John doesn't want us to walk away from the study of his book by just having a, I think it's the case. He wants us to have assurance or certainty that we have true, genuine faith in Jesus Christ. And as we go back to this final few verses, what John wants to do is jump off this assurance of faith by laying out six things that right now, if you have a true faith in Jesus Christ, there are th six things that you can have assurance or certainty about. Now, if that's not something to listen to, I'm not sure what it is. Because we live in a world today where there's always going to be doubt, right? That's what life is all about. How do I really know this is true? How do I know that's not true? All these questions begin to arise. But John has been laying out for us over the last four or five verse chapters, excuse me, about the fact that right now there's no one in this room that should be able to doubt their true faith in Jesus Christ. I hope and pray that when today is over, whether this is your first time for this study, you've been here the whole 15 weeks, that you know clearly where you stand with Jesus Christ. That you know whether you're not, you have a counterfeit faith or you have an authentic faith in him. And so what are these six things that John wants us to have a certain, uh, assurance about or certainty? Well, the first one comes from verse 13, which we've talked a lot about in our study here. The first one John wants us to be certain about is eternal life. In fact, John says this, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. And when I've talked about this verse, I said this is one of the key verses that John has in the book because John's laying out one of the main reasons why he's writing this book. For what? To reassure them or us today of their salvation in Jesus Christ. A very important topic because we know the backdrop. 
John is addressing false teachers who have come into the church, who have begun to promote lies and deception. And in the midst of that confusion, he says, look it, don't be confused. Know where you stand with Christ. And of course, we, we saw a few weeks ago, this is the same reason why John wrote his gospel. If you read John chapter 20, verse 30 and 31, why did John write the gospel? For the same reason why he wrote this first epistle. Because he wants us to know where we stand in our faith with Jesus Christ. So John begins this verse here with this phrase, I write these things. So what does John mean by this? John's just referring to everything he's wrote so far in this book. And what has John been doing? As I said before, John has been writing over the last four and a half chapters, tests for you and I to determine, to decipher whether or not our faith in Christ is counterfeit or genuine. And what's been the goal for John? The goal for John has been this. He wants his readers or us to know this, to have assurance or confidence that we have eternal life. That's what John's goal is in this whole book. That when you're done reading this, you can look at your life and say, do I have an authentic faith that gives me assurance that I know where I stand when it comes to eternal life? I hope and pray you do. That no matter what today or next week may bring, that you know that if it was your final day in this earth, there would be no doubting about where you stand when it comes to your eternal destiny. That like John, you will have the assurance or certainty to know where you stand. So what's the basis for this assurance? Well, John's very clear because it comes from the one they have placed their faith in. And who have they placed their faith in? He says, you've placed it in Jesus Christ. So I want to be very clear today. We've missed it up somehow in the church. We think if we just have enough faith, if we just believe enough that somehow that's where the assurance comes, that's not where our assurance comes from. My assurance of my salvation does not come from my faith or my belief. It comes from the object of my faith or belief. And who is that? It's Jesus Christ. John said it very well. Who believe in what? In the name of the Son of God. There are a lot of things right now in this room that you guys believe in. But when it comes to your eternal destiny, there is only one person that you can have assurance that you know you are saved. It is Jesus Christ. This is an important issue. Because maybe you're looking at me today. Maybe it's not an issue for you. But in my experience, people struggle so much about knowing whether they truly have salvation. They struggle with this assurance. And you want to know why people struggle with their assurance and salvation? Because they have the wrong source they're trusting in. See, most people try to trust in themselves. If you don't believe me, this is what Barner Research said. It said 48% of people, 48, believe that if I'm generally good or if I do enough good things, that I'll earn a place in heaven, that I'll have eternal life. That's a dangerous place. If today you're placing your assurance in what you're trying to do to earn it, you're in a dangerous place. I'm going to give you two reasons why works-based will never get you to the assurance of salvation. The first one is this. It's what I call the quantity and quality questions. What I mean by that is just imagine if you're trying to work your way to heaven. You stand before God and God says, hey, look it, you've done a great job. But I, I hate to tell you this. You're just one work short. If you just done one more, you could have got in, but you know, I'm sorry, you're one work short, right? Hey, you might laugh, but hey, how do we know? Does God say you need to do a thousand and one works? Maybe you're just one short. Or how about the quality? You stand before God and God's like, you know what? I know everyone around you said you're a pretty good guy, but come on, we know your heart. You were just helping those people out because you were doing it for your own benefit. The quality of, your, of what you did was more for you than what you're doing for me. And see, I don't care right now. If you're trying to earn your way to heaven, you will never have assurance because you'll always be asking yourself, did I do enough? And did what I do, is it good enough? But more powerful than that, it's the very testimony of God's word because what does God's word say? Whether we're, just like what John says here, our assurance comes from one place. It comes from Jesus Christ and him alone. Paul says it this way in Romans 6, 23, a verse that we all know. He says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Do you see the power of this? We have been given a gift by God that gives us the assurance that if we place our faith and trust in him, we can know that we have eternal life. That's where our assurance comes from. It comes from Jesus Christ. And when you place your assurance in him, it changes you. It produces peace. It produces joy. But you know what else it does? It, it empowers you to want to go share that truth with other people. You see, right now, if you're doubting your assurance, I really probably would put a good bet that you don't share your faith with other people. Why would I? 
Can you imagine, hey, I wanted to share eternal life with you through Christ, but I'm not quite sure if I have it or not. I'm trying my best to figure it out. See, if I have doubts about eternal life, it's not going to motivate me to want to go straight out with other people. But once I know where I stand in Christ, once I know that my assurance rests in him, then you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go out there and I'm going to lay it out to people. This is where faith, this is where eternal life comes from. It is the same thing with a physical illness. Maybe you're doubting some treatment that you think that someone says try may work for you. But guess what? When you try that treatment and it changes your physical state, what do you start doing? You tell everyone, let me tell you about the assurance I have because it's changed my life. And that's what we need to have in Christ. He is our assurance. He empowers us to go out there and share that eternal hope that we have with others. Besides eternal life, the second surgery that we have occurs in verse 14 and 15. And John says this. You have the certainty of answered prayer. This is what he says. This is the confidence that we have toward him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of him. So as Christians, as believers in Christ, what is John saying? That we have the certainty that God hears and answers our prayers. Now let's be real. Some of you are looking at me and saying, BJ, some of my prayers, I'm still waiting to be answered. Well, that's the power of what John does. He qualifies our prayers being answered and heard by God by two important things. And please make sure you hear this. The first one is this, fellowship with God. John says that each of us should approach God as believers with confidence. That Greek word for confidence, you know what it means? It means to have the freedom to speak, the freedom to share your thoughts. And so what John is saying is that as Christians, that when we go before God, we should be open to freely share with him our needs and our struggles, that we should let him know how we feel. How many of you guys do that? It's not like God's waiting for me to say, BJ, how do you really feel? He knows how I feel, but I have the freedom, the confidence to go before him and say, Lord, this is what I'm going through. Here's my struggles. Here's what I'm going. Here's what I don't quite understand what you're doing in my life. And here's what I want you to understand very clear. The confidence that we have to do that is not in our prayers. I'm not here to give you a formula. I'm not here to give you certain words that will give you more confidence in your prayers. What I'm going to tell you, the confidence in your prayer life is the one that you're praying to. When you understand that God is your heavenly father who is good and who is faithful and has your best interest at heart, it changes the way that you approach him. There's that confidence, that openness to say, Lord, this is how I feel. This is my struggles, but I know who you are. And that's what John wants us to understand. Right now, there are many of you struggling with many things. And you have got to stop letting your prayer life be defined by your circumstances. You've got to let your prayer life be defined by the one who you're praying to. And when you understand who God is, when you have that fellowship with him, you can move forward trusting him. This fellowship is so vital. Because we cannot think that we're going to gain this perspective of God by just showing up and saying, God, I got a problem today. I'll see you next week when you fix this. It is a daily fellowship with God. The more I spend time with God, the more I know his heart. The more I understand that he knows what's best for my life. So the more I can do the very second thing. What's the second thing besides fellowship to have answered prayer? It is to submit to his will. John says it this way. We are to ask what? According to his will. That means right now, if you want to hear God If you want God to hear and answer your prayer, then you must do this. You must seek his will and not your own. You should pray where you desire God's will to be accomplished. You need to surrender to that, even what? Even if it doesn't line up with what you want. Wow, it may be a lot different than what you've heard. But this is what John is saying. Powerful, effective prayer that God hears and responds to is when we surrender ourselves over to what he has desired in that situation. The greatest example, which we all know, is Jesus himself. Because before he went to the cross for you and for me, he was in that garden of Gethsemane, praying to the Father. And this is what he says in Luke 22, 42. He says, Father, if you are willing, what? Remove this cup from me. In other words, Lord, if there's a, Father, if there's a different way, I'm willing to listen to that. But what does he come to? Not my will, but your will be done. This is a powerful point for you guys to understand. Because in the time that I've been in ministry, I have seen people go through a faith crisis. And the faith crisis is over this, over a prayer that was never answered the way they wanted it to be answered. I had one guy specifically who says, I no longer believe in God. And I asked him why. He goes, because I prayed for my daughter to be healed from cancer and she died. I want to make this very clear. There are places in scripture where God reveals to us what his will is. His will is for us to be sanctified, to be conformed to his image of his Christ. His will is for us to submit, right? 
But there are times in our lives we're praying for specific situations where God has not chosen to reveal his will to us. So what do we have to do? We have to walk in confidence with an openness before God to say, I don't know what your will is, but I'm going to seek you and I'm going to desire for you to be glorified. I don't just preach it. I have to live that. You guys have heard me talk about my daughter's ankle. And I only bring it up because in two weeks from now, she has her seventh ankle surgery. And I tell you what, I've been confident with God. You want to know what? I have, been, I have poured my heart out. He knows where I stand in this issue. He knows the hurt that I have for my daughter to watch her in constant pain. The struggles that I have to see God. Why didn't you fix it the first, the second, the third, etc.? But not knowing what his will is through this, you know what my prayer is? And I pray that you take this prayer in your own situation is this. God, you are good and faithful. And as Mariah's heavenly father, you know what is best for her. And may your will be done in her life. And may you be glorified in this situation. That is not easy for a father to come to. But when I have fellowship with him and I surrender my will to him, I know that he has such a greater plan than I can ever imagine for her. And I pray, God, that you guys will understand the power of answered prayer when you know who God is and you surrender to what he has for your life. The third certainty comes from verse 16 and 17. This is a certainty of forgiveness. This is what John says. If anyone sees his brother, we can put sister there, committing a sin not leading to death, he shall ask and God will give him life to those who commit sins that do not lead to death. There is sin that leads to death. I do not say that one should pray for that. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is sin that does not lead to death. Now, last week I said, man, this is a tough passage, you know, the whole thing about God's testimony about Jesus. And I'm just like, oh, thank you, John, for another great verse to try to figure out. In fact, I was reading one commentator, and they said, this is why people don't preach verse by verse, because it's just easier to skip this, right? But if, if, there, if it's in Scripture, there's, a, there's something that God wants us to understand, because I'm going to be honest with you, there's a lot of discussion about what does John mean by here. And myself, as I'm studying this passage, I'm asking two questions. John, who are you writing to? Who are you referring to? Is he referring to a believer who's living in willful sin or is to an unbeliever? And what is this sin that leads to death? There's a lot of commentaries that have been written about that. Is this a specific sin? Is this blaspheming the Holy Spirit? Is this a rejection of Jesus Christ? Or... Is John just talking about general sin in our lives where we persistently and willfully continue to walk in that in disobedience? Well, I don't want to get distracted by what we don't know, so I'm going to focus on what we do know. There's three things I want you to grasp about this certainty of forgiveness. Three things that John wants us to understand. Here's the first one. We should pray for other believers who John refers to as brothers who are involved in sin. This is important because many of you guys pray for the, your own spiritual well-being, Right? But how much do you pray for your brothers and sisters for their own spiritual well-being? And I love what John says here because John says that when we see, and that's a very good word. Because what John is saying is not when you hear secondary or you saw posted on social media. He says, no, when you see, when you have evidence that your brother and sister is not walking faithfully in Christ, what should your response be? Gossip? Slander? Put a little like in that social media post. That's not what John says. John says, when you have evidence that your brother or sister is walking unfaithfully to the Lord, the response is get on your knees and cry out for them. Pray on their behalf. And that's what we are called to do. That God will restore that person back to fellowship with him and fellowship with the church. Galatians 6.1 talks about this. This is the Apostle Paul says, Brothers or sisters, if anyone is caught in any transgression, once again, evidence that they are committing a sin. He says, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness, a spirit of humility. Then he says, keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. In other words, don't come with a self-righteous attitude. Know where you stand. Make sure you're on guard yourself because you could fall as well. See, John has throughout this whole book has reminded us one powerful thing. The greatest evidence that you have an authentic faith in Jesus Christ is that you show agape love. You show love towards other believers. And I'll tell you right now, there's not a greater way to show love for another believer than when you see them walking in sin, you fall on your knees and cry out, say, God, restore my brother and sister. I love them and I don't want them to walk in a way that's not honoring to you. Is that your heart? Is that your response? Besides the fact that we should pray for each other, John wants us to understand that sin has consequences. We'll go back to our passage here. And what, what John says here is that while we should pray for others, there are some times when we pray for that person, they have a sin that God's not going to respond to. Because John's very clear, all sin is wrong, right? 
But he says there is a sins, plural, that lead to life, and a sin, singular, that leads to death. Now, here's the limitation that we have. The text doesn't tell us which sins lead to life and which sin leads to death. So we're kind of left leaving this in the Lord's hands. Personally, this is my view, that sin unto death is a willful, continuous, unrepentant sin. And when John says about death, he's referring to physical death. If you look at John's gospel, John chapter 11, verse 4, you can look it on your own. This phrase, unto death, is only used one other time in Scripture, that place as well. And what he's talking about is physical death. There are other people who claim that what John's referring to is rejection of Jesus Christ and a spiritual death. Now, if you want to ask me, as although I lean for the first, I'll say both of them are very faithful to the text, whichever one you want to come to. But it leads us to this three point because I want to be very clear. If you have sin in your life, do not live in ignorance that that sin will not impact you and those around you. Sin has consequences. But this leads to the third powerful truth that John wants us to understand from this passage, that God both, listen, judges and he forgives sin. You see, sin in our lives will lead you down a path. And as you go down this path, God does the very first thing. He lovingly responds by trying to discipline you. If your parents have ever disciplined you, and hopefully in the right context, it's an act of love. That's what God does. God says, I discipline those that I love. He goes, I step in. I see them in sin. I see them knocking the way that they should be walking. So I'm going to step in. I'm going to discipline them with the intention of restoration to get them back in fellowship with me. Always with what desire does God have to extend forgiveness when the person asks for it. However, the father, you or I continue in unrepentant sin. And the more our hearts get hardened to God, what does God have to do? He has to judge that sin. And what John says is that sometimes in special cases, that judgment will come where that person's life will be taken. We have a great example in Acts chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira, right? They said they're going to give some money to the church. They lied to the Holy Spirit, so God took their lives. We ask, why did God take it? Was it just their lying? God took it not only for their lying, but to maintain the holiness and purity of the church. And so we'll have this debate continue about what John means. I I want you to get this point here. That sin is destructive in our lives. The farther we go down the path of living in willful sin, the more your hearts will get hardened towards the truth of God's word to the point that, listen, even the prayers of other believers on your behalf will go unanswered. God is patient and loving. But let us not forget, he is holy and righteous. And there's a limit to his tolerance of sin in our lives. At this current time, and maybe this example will make this a little bit, summarize all this stuff for you. I'm praying for a dear friend, a brother in Christ who I I care deeply about. Known him for a long time. Come to find out that he is allowing a sin in his life that is destroying him and his family. I've confronted him on it by the word of God. I've told him that God is waiting and willing to, to extend forgiveness. But he continues to walk down this path of disobedience. And the fear that I have is that there'll come a point that the more I begin to pray for him, the more I realize that my prayers will not go answered because of one thing. He has hardened his heart and refuses to repent. And it breaks my heart to watch him walk down a path that I know if he does not repent, that even my prayers can't prevent him going down a path of self-destruction. My prayer today is not for just this person. I hope right now that they're going to listen to this sermon when it gets posted. But my prayer is also for anyone in this room today who is living in willful sin. Confess your sin to God and find forgiveness. Allow repentance to be the means by which you're restored back to God. I love this verse and we've heard it before in our study of 1 John. This is what John says about who God is and how he responds to our sin. This is 1 John 1 verse 9. He says, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin. And to what? Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There are people in your life who have hurt you that to this very moment, you won't even look at them. Anger, bitterness, all those emotions are filling your mind right now. You think about them. But yet God says, you can disobey me. You can walk in a way that I've called you not to walk. But I promise you this. I'll give you the certainty that when you cry out to me in godly repentance, I will forgive you and restore you back to me. What a powerful certainty that God, John has communicated to us about God. We go to verse 18, we see the fourth certainty, the certainty of divine protection. John says, we know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning. But he who has been born of God protects him and the evil one does not touch him. 
So we've talked about this concept of born again throughout our study of 1 John. So I'll just simply say born again means what? You are given a new nature. The Holy Spirit indwells within you and what? You become a member of God's family. And as a part of God's family, what has John given us the certainty about? That we have the certainty or the assurance that what? God protects us. And specifically, John says that right now God is protecting you from two things. The first one is sin. Now, will we struggle with sin? Unfortunately, yes. That's why we have to always know we have to go before God and repent, right? We're going to struggle with sin in our lives. But listen, through the death of Jesus Christ, we not only have we what? Received the forgiveness for our sins, but God has given us the provisions to walk in victory. God didn't just say, the moment you gave your life to me, I said, hey, good, you're forgiven. Go off and do what you want. He says, I have given you the provisions to not only walk in forgiveness, but to walk in victory. The provisions of God's word, the provisions of the Holy Spirit living within me, the provision of the church. These have been given by God for victory in our lives to not fall constantly in defeat to habitual patterns of sin in our lives. But John says God has not just given you protection from sin, but also from Satan. John refers to him in this verse as the evil one. And what he's saying is the evil one, Satan, cannot touch those who are born of God. We live in such fear, don't we? But the greatest enemy has no authority over your life. If you are a believer in Christ today, you have the Holy Spirit living within you. You have God's divine protection over you. That's what I love. What is, why can't Satan touch me? Because what does John say? Because God protects us. That Greek word for protect, this is what it means. To stand guard or to watch over. That means in the world that we live in where Satan has these schemes to what? Deceive and to pull us away from God. What do we have as an assurance or confidence to know that God is our protector. In the spiritual battle that you find yourself in right now, which by the way, if you don't know you're, what you're in one, then you need to wake up. Because when you guys go back to college, when you go off to high school, when you go to work, the spiritual battle is already turning on. And in the midst of that spiritual battle, you want, may sometimes say, God, I feel so alone. I feel ill-equipped to take this on. I feel like there's just no hope. And God is saying, why, my son, my daughter? I am the one who's protecting you in the midst of it. I am the one who guards over your life. What a certainty to know. Jesus said it very well when he talks about him being the good shepherd. In John 10, 27, 28, Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. And I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. And listen, no one will snatch them out of my hand. What a great certainty to remember that God protects his children. We go to the next certainty, what's in verse 19. This is the certainty of acceptance. And this is what John says. We know that we are from God. And the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Once again, a reference to Satan. So John just gives two powerful truths in this verse. The first one is this, that if you're a believer, if you are born again, who do you belong to? You belong to God. You are, what, part of his family. God is your father. But today, if you're not a believer and you belong to the world, who are you under the authority of? Under Satan himself. The world today belongs to Satan. It is under his influence and authority. Therefore, as believers, we cannot look to this world to find our identity and purpose. I don't get that. Why, as believers, do we spend so much of energy watching everything on, on movies and watching television, filling our mind up with this world? Because the world, if we know, is being led by Satan. It is not designed to draw you closer to Christ. It is to pull you away from Christ. Rather, right now, we find our identity and purpose in what? In our relationship with God himself. Our heavenly father who says, look it, I loved you so much. I sent my son to die on the cross. Let me ask you right now, what is the world doing for you? Is the world sacrificing for you? Is the world giving its life for you? No, it is God who has given his life through his son for you. That's where identity and purpose come from. With all the evil and wickedness around us, what a blessing to know that right now I know who I am. I am a child of God and that I have the assurance, no matter what may go on in my life, that I am accepted by him. In a day where all of us will feel, feel the rejection of other people, we know one thing for sure, the moment we give our life to Jesus Christ, we are accepted by our Heavenly Father. Paul says it very well in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2 and 3. I'm going to read from the New Living Translation. He wants us to know what is life like without Jesus. Well, this is what it's like. And some of you guys can testify. He says, you used to live in sin. Just like the rest of the world. Obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. 
By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger just like everyone else. But then we go to verse 4 and 5. This is life like what it's like with Jesus. He says, but God is so rich in his mercy. He loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when we were raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. What a truth. Do you see the contrast? That if I'm going to follow this world, this is what the fruit of it is. But if I'm going to follow God and belong to God, look what he has done for me. His grace has extended into my life to give me life. And we go to the last truth in verse 20 and 21. It is the certainty of the truth of who Jesus Christ is. And so John says this, And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know Him who is true. And we are in Him who is true, in His Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God in eternal life. And then John closes by saying, Little children, keep yourselves from idols. So in the midst of these false teachers making claims about Jesus, what does John say? That we have the certainty of knowing who Jesus Christ is. In fact, in verse 20, John refers to that word true three times. That Greek word for true literally means genuine. So what John is saying, I want you to be very clear about this. The question of who Jesus Christ is right now does not depend upon my subjective, blind opinion or faith. But what John wants us to understand that who Jesus Christ is, is based upon objective, genuine truth. He's laid it out for us. In the very opening of the chapter 1, what does John say about Jesus? He says, look it, I was an eyewitness. I personally saw him live. I saw him die and I saw him rise from the grave. And besides that personal eyewitness testimony of who Jesus Christ is, what does John also say? That testimony doesn't just come from me. It comes from who? From God himself. In verse 6 through 12 of chapter 5, last week, what do we say? That God himself has testified through the water, the blood, and the spirit. And listen to the sermon last week, what those mean. That he had, God has testified that Jesus Christ is who? The Son of God. So not only do we have a human personal testimony, but we have God's divine testimony about who Christ is. And based upon this, we can know with certainty that Jesus Christ came to earth. This very thing that we'll celebrate in about a month called Christmas we're not just going to celebrate a tradition. We're going to celebrate an objective truth about something that happened in history. And then John closes, as I said, with these endearing words of dear children. I like how John ends it because John's been giving some tough talk, hasn't he? Not politically correct. He's laying it out. But you can see that in this term of dear children, it shows his affection and concern for their spiritual well-being. It's like a father looking at their child and seeing that they're struggling. They have doubts. And he's saying, look it, I love you. Let me give you some truth. And I hope you understand that in every single sermon I've done on the first John, that's been my desire. Like John pouring out to them, I've tried to pour out my affection and my concern for you, for your own spiritual well-being. And then besides his concern, he gives them a final command. He says, what? Keep away from idols. That Greek word for keep means to guard or protect yourself. So John is saying, listen, you need to guard or protect yourself from any idols. Now, before you just kind of just tune out for a second and say, well, I ain't got any statues in my uh, home. What John means by idols is more than having a statue in your home. What John is referring to is that any attempt on your own to define God in the way that you want God to be defined. When you're doing that right now, you're not going to God's word to let God be who he is and who Jesus Christ is, then you are, what, creating an idol of God in your own image. But beyond that too, it's when you allow something, and it could be your job, it could be a relationship, it could be the desire for sex, but when you allow something besides God to capture your heart, that's an idol in your life. And in contrast to worshiping the things of this world, what does John tell us to do? To give our full devotion and worship towards Jesus Christ. Who does he say Jesus is? The true God in eternal life. We come to our closing challenge, not just today, but of our whole series on 1 John. And what's been the central question? You guys all know this. You can say it right back to me. It's like you probably hear it at night when you're sleeping, right? It is this. How can I know my faith is authentic? But if you haven't fallen asleep by now, right? I've changed the question for you today, haven't I? Because here we are. We're at the end. So the question is no longer how can I know? Because you know. For 15 weeks, John is saying, how can you know? So now we're going to personalize it. Is my faith authentic? Is my faith authentic? And it's to go back and say, okay, John, I'll answer that in light of the test you're giving me, the test of truth. Do I believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world? Do you? Or how about the test of agape love that John has put us out? 
Do I show that same selfless love to others that Jesus Christ has shown me? Do you show that selfless agape love to others? Or how about the test of obedience? Do I walk in a consistent pattern of obedience to what God commands? I want to be very real with you right now. I hope and pray that everyone in this room right now can answer that question in the affirmative, that they know that they have that authentic faith. But as much as it is so important for you to have that certainty, you know who else needs this? The world. Because if we know right now that we're bombarded by confusion over what's counterfeit and what's authentic, then can we not be, as a body of Christ, the exact opposite of what the world portrays? Can we not be that authentic example of Christ to this world? Can they not see me when I'm at work, when I'm with my friends, when I'm at college, when I'm at school, when I'm behind closed doors and no one knows what I'm doing but God alone? Can they not see someone who says, I'm going to be an authentic example of Jesus Christ? Because I'm going to tell you something right now. As much as you need that for your own life, that certainty, this world needs to see the certainty within your life that you are an authentic follower of Jesus Christ. I love what John says here in 1 John 2.6. He says, whoever says he abides in God who has an authentic faith, ought to walk in the same way in which Jesus Christ walked. May the certainty of your salvation change the way you live and may this world see in you and I an authentic example of Jesus Christ. Let's go to the Lord in prayer.